with no prep, is that sufficient to put you in license two? Or do we need to see lesson planning, appropriate wait time, all these other little skills that go into what we know is pedagogy and good pedagogy? What is the requisite number of those skills you've got to have to move you into that next license level? Does that make sense? Yes, that does. And one of the other thoughts that you were speaking about, Tomlin, was if we were to look at the current evaluation or observation rubric, I would say like that learning permit, that developing those things in that category would be all some of those things that's in that particular budget that they do. So we have to really drill down to those basic skills that we're currently looking at and saying before we can move up, that would be one of the things. But yeah, I get that concept. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a real challenge because you're going to have to do this in some ways without knowing what the measures are. You're going to have to think about this. So in other words, you're going to have to say, okay, in order for a teacher to move from license one to license two, you're going to have to have these five skills. Let's say you decide that those five skills, if you're going, let's assume you're going to pedagogy, you're going to do pedagogy first and you're trying to move from license one to license two using the pedagogy mastery. You're going to have to come up with what are those skills? You may not know yet how they're going to be measured because that's another group that's developing those things and saying, how are we going to measure this? But you're identifying what those skills are that tip the hat and tip the scale and let you move to the next license area. And then, you know, all those resources. And I think this question about NISAs is a great one. I am not the expert on NISAs, but, you know, and I'll let Dr. Sox talk a little bit about that. But I think that's absolutely right. You can't have a licensure system or a human capital system without a properly aligned evaluation instrument. So those are great. And you've got the right person on this team facilitating Dr. Sox because he's going to help. How does this integrate with the evaluation process? And I want to add just something real quick. I think that's a great observation, that connection to NISAs. Because I think the intent of the rubric, if you think about that developing column, that really is speaking to the kinds of things that we would want those teachers who were just prepared to have. In fact, if you were to look at the pre-service rubric for teachers, the proficient column for a pre-service teacher is the same stuff that is in our developing column. So that relationship is really powerful. So I think that'll be a really good strategy when the time comes to really sit down and put heads together to figure out what those things might be. I think putting NISAs on the table could be a really good thing to generate ideas and keep that aligned. The other thing that was in the slide that Maureen shared a minute ago is a very real outcome of this could be not only that we use NISAs and its current status to inform how this licensure movement pathway works, but we could discover things that we believe are logical recommendations for improvement of our evaluation processes in the future so that these two things will dovetail and align. So we'll be able to try to hold those things in a space where they can help contribute to future discussions around improvements to NISAs. So thanks. That was a great connection. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Sox, for bringing that up because we did have a question in the chat. Are we removing the current assessment process or integrating it into a new process? And I think you answered that question there with yours that we may take some parts of that current evaluation process, but then maybe look at ways to improve and modify that so that it works better for actually evaluating our teachers. We also had a question, are the advanced teacher mentors being paid and how are they being trained or is that another committee? So I'll kind of take that to the beginning, but then Dr. Tomlin and Dr. Sox, if you want to jump on and add. So the payment piece is being handled by another committee. 
we will be the ones who determine the skills that you would need to move from one level to the next. So as you're as you're looking at moving into that advanced teacher role, we will look at the skills required to move from the expert teacher to the advanced teacher. Um, but then there will be other groups who are working on the actual payment structure of how that will look, and then also working on the um, the actual pieces of of how that will look at that that next level. But if somebody else wants to um, add a little bit more information about that, that'd be great. Yeah, I, uh, Maureen, I think you have it exactly right. So <clears throat> the uh, there are pieces of this that are going to get worked out by other folks. So. So another question on the advanced teacher roles that's come up, just to go ahead and put it out there so you're all aware that these questions have been asked and, and assigned to those subcommittees. Is, is this gonna be allotment driven um, or is it gonna be some other kind of calculation that determines the number of advanced teachers? And is it going to be separate from the regular teacher allotment? In other words, it's not, um, you know, the, this, the budget cut subcommittee is gonna determine whether you uh, you identify teachers in your teacher allotment or if we create a separate allotment for, for LEAs with advanced teacher roles. So um, that, that all is gonna be worked out uh, as well as the salary level for that. Um, and, but we will take, you know, as questions like this come up, don't feel like you can't ask those questions in the subcommittee. They're, absolutely critical for us building a good model and please don't be disappointed when we say that's a great question we're going to capture it and we're going to take it to this subcommittee because that's how the work is really going to get um, integrated and coordinated is that you you may be asking a question that nobody in that other subcommittee has thought about yet and so we want to make sure all this this great thought gets captured and that's the job of the dpi team so we will, you know, when, when, once we determine that's a question that belongs over here, we'll make sure we capture it and get it to that team so that they can consider it and, and see how it works. You also, uh, once you start making decisions that this must happen, we're gonna have to take those decisions and communicate them to the other subcommittees because decisions you make here will have impact on what other subcommittees, it will inform their work. They'll have to address those things. So um, I hope that that makes sense, and I hope if it doesn't, that as we move through this process, it'll start to kind of become clear to you. Um, Dr. Tomberlin, Ms. Stover, can I ask a question? Um, just kind of uh, put to the group. I was not here in the first meeting. This is Keisha Clemens, um, and good morning to everybody. Um, I was not here in, in the first meeting, um, so I may be misunderstanding a little bit, but from what I, um, from what I, I, I thought you said, is that we still, we're not creating a new uh, evaluation system. That's gonna stay intact. Um, and within that like rubric, there are already specific skills built into that. So for, are, are you asking our team to begin with this kind of brainstorming uh, things, or should we start with some sort of what we have in place and looking at those skills that are built in into that evaluation system and looking at what we think is most important and kind of going about it that way? Like, how do you want us to approach this part? Are we just brainstorming without influence of any framework? Or do we need to start with something to kind of pull up some of those skills that we think are the most important? Does, I don't know if my question makes sense, but you can follow up with that. So this is Tom, and it makes perfect sense to me. Um, and um, I think that you should consider everything that's out there that we're either providing to you or what currently exists as a resource, not a requirement. So take what you want from, from Nisus. Take what you want from that Teaching Works document we sent you. Take what you want from the NTPA and say, these are the things that we find critical. This is yours to create. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about the evaluation system. It will, we, that will be work that has to be done. If, if you create something for which the evaluation system is no longer sufficient, then we'll do that work to make sure that that gets aligned. 
Um, so don't feel like you're, you're bounded by anything other than those two guiding questions that we put in front of you. Um, does this have impact on students and their learning? And can you measure this in an authentic way in the classroom, in the present yeah, I want to read, this is Robert, I want to reiterate what Tom just said. As the person who has to help support NISIs across the state right now, I think it's critical that this group not be constrained by the NISIs rubric or the NISIs process. It is one of a large array of things that can inform this. We just have to remember that the evaluation system is going to be continuing and moving forward, and at some point in the future, this license advancement process and our evaluation system will have to coexist. So with that in mind, I think the evaluation system can be a good element of this. An example I will give is if you understand the rubric, we've already spoken to the idea that the developing column information can help inform the questions what do we need for the teachers to know and be able to do on the left side of this image but if you move way over to the proficient column if you know that rubric well you know the proficient column is about influencing other professionals in the building well that's the work of those teachers at the right hand side of this so as we think of all of the kinds of things that should inform this advancement or movement or matriculation through this a thing that should be at the table is the question, if these are the things in the rubric, where do they kind of fit along this, and how does that influence the decisions that we make? But we need to be cautious, because if we feel overly connected to the evaluation rubric, I think it can actually get in our way. This is Tonya Smith. May I uh, ask a question or just make a statement, please? As a teacher that is still in the classroom, um, I love that we're actually doing this work and we're really looking at it and digging in uh, really hard. What I would like to see, because I'm doing two peer evaluations for two of my mentees this week actually, I want us to make sure that um, whatever it is we put in place has no room for subjectivity. Um, I would like for it to be very clear and concise and easily measured so that you know, if I'm looking at it, I can actually, I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense to echo Ms. Clemens, but do, do you understand what I'm asking? I want to make sure that the steps that we're looking for on this tiered system are clear and concise so that there is no question. So this is Tom, uh, Ms. Stover, if, may I respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. Please do. So I, I, you're, you're singing our song. Um, <laughs> we want, uh, so this has to be uniformly measurable, it has to be reliable. That is, different people um, looking at this would come to the same conclusion. If you'll notice, there's no language in any of this, especially, this is especially important for this group, that, that, that talks about principal evaluation as 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 a driver of this and that's not saying that it's where it's totally off the table but if your point if the, if the group is in agreement on what you just said principal evaluation could not be part of this because we know it's much too variable um, from district to district and and that's okay I mean, we're not that's not a criticism that's just a statement of fact that that would not be a uniform. do what Absolutely. That's, I'm not being critical. I'm not, you know, I'm just saying that in my experience, you know, I've had over, over my 25 years of teaching, just, you know, working towards self-reflection and improving my work, I would work one year as hard as humanly possible and my evaluation go down. And then just, I'm in the, I'm in the trenches in that. So you guys know how that feels. And just making sure that if, if it's clear and concise, there's no question, and then you can go forward and keep continue to improve as you teach. You know, you've got those steps. So yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why we have not kind of put this out there, um, is because the the reliability of that of that measure is 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 not what we would consider up to standard for a statewide license. Um, so you need to think about that. I'm not saying that that's off the table. I'm just saying that's going to be the pushback is how do you measure that authentically and reliably across all teachers across the state? 
Um, so those are the type, kinds of things you need to address. Now with that, you have to understand that some of these measures will, it, it won't be possible to do this, what we call quantitatively. They aren't absolute numbers that we can, we can run the numbers. So um, we'll help talk about when we're, when, when you're talking about qualitative um, examples of, of, you know, of demonstration of effectiveness, how do you ensure some reliability to that? And we'll, we'll get into that later. So you shouldn't shy away from qualitative measures. They, they're important. Um, they're necessary for something as a, a, like teaching, which is really a, a really delicate or nuanced mix of art and science. So you're going to need some of that qualitative in there. But we'll assist with how you make sure that those are as reliable and valid as they can possibly be. But it's a great point, and I think it's one this, this group needs to hold in, in their head um, <coughs> as they yeah, if, if, if I could, If I could piggyback, this is Jeff and Barrett, if I could piggyback on what uh, Tom just said, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm certain that we could all tell stories from um, our history and education, some good and some not so good interactions with colleagues. Um, and I tend to increasingly be the oldest person around in here, but after, after 38 years, I'll tell you this. Uh, we have to have, we have to consider some qualitative considerations of this reality of education. I think what, we're, what we're, we've got to worry about is not having a uh, I look at it like a, like a lake that's leaking around the dams, and we keep trying to patch little holes here and there and fix no point there and then let it fix that. When what we have to do is look at the entire process, and that would include principals themselves, what kind of uh, training and professional development they go through and expectations in trying to do their qualitative um, evaluation. Um, I, I just, I just want to think about what Tom said. I, I, I don't think you should dismiss the qualitative aspect completely because there is a place for that. We had another question in the chat that's, um, if issue can occur at multiple points, learning permit through level three, then how do we define skills needed to move through these levels without being part of the work of entry and craft? And I think with that one, um, you know, there will be some overlap where things at entry and prep are inquiring to, for wh where you enter in will overlap with some of the work we're doing to say, what are those skills? So based on the skills that we say you must have to be at level one, two, three, um, entry and prep would then say, okay, well, a pre-service teacher with this experience would go into this level. Um, and so I, there, there will be some work where we're overlapping and that's why that communication piece will be critically important as we move forward in this process so that entry and prep understands what we're doing, we understand what budget and compensation is doing, and that way we're all able to work together so that we're, we're able to come up with a cohesive system that, that makes sense and works for teachers in our state. And if um, Dr. Tomberlin or Dr. Sochner, what else wanted to add in on that one, please do. I think you put it very well. <laughs> I think Dr. Hart wanted to say something. She had put a comment in the chat. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Is that right, Dr. Hart? Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, so a, c a couple of things strike me, and there may be some, some pieces that uh, some of the folks on the call may, may, may help. Um, one, one thing that I'm not sure that um, folks outside of higher ed are aware is that in order for us to make a licensure recommendation for a candidate who is completing a uh, teacher preparation program, there's a document that gets signed off on, and, and I'm sorry, I think somebody's got their mute off, because um, I'm hearing some feedback, so I, I don't know who that is, but um, there is a document that has to be signed off on by the faculty supervisor from the university, by the cooperating teacher in the classroom, and by the principal to ensure that they have seen the student teacher demonstrate these, these standards. And I don't know that that necessarily has to be used verbatim in its current form, but it's 
pull it pulls directly from the I'm going to use the word observable me, uh, North Carolina teacher evaluation standards, and it's a form that all the universities use in conjunction with our people partners. And if if both the university folks and the school system folks don't agree, then that person doesn't move forward for a licensure recommendation. And so I thought sharing that might be uh, at least a starting point for looking at the kinds of things that if we say, okay, we, we would expect to see this, we would expect to see that, you know, that, those are the things that we're looking at now. And I know that this document, um, and, and you guys shared the um, teaching works practices, those kinds of things certainly could, could add or inform that, but it might be a starting point, and I was just going to put a link in the chat to share that document with folks. It also currently aligns with, with NEPIS, which I understand may or may not need some, some revision or some tweaking after all this work is done. I, I also think I wanted to comment on, on Tabari Wallace's comment, um, and I've heard Tom mention, uh, Tom and I are in a lot of the same meetings, so I've heard this conversation before and in other um, subcommittee groups that I've been listening to the recordings around the, the problem with pre principal evaluation. That principal evaluation, I, I understand from a research sort of logistical perspective that that there may be um, a need to increase the training or to talk about how that tool is used more effectively. Um, and I, I think I, I have some concerns around, you know, this, I don't want to use the word dismissing time because I don't think that's what you meant and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but this idea that we've got to come up with some measure that, that doesn't necessarily integrate the principal evaluation. And, I, and again, I know we're not saying that we wouldn't in all of those pieces, but there are so many different needs from so many different districts. And going back to, I think, uh, Tanya's, or maybe may somebody else's comment around um, personal reflection, you know, the, how those things get measured and what they look like for different districts and different teachers might be very personalized and very different. Um, depending on needs and whatnot. And I, I get it that we have to have a common standard, but then I also hear work, uh, hear conversations around, um, we want to open up this, this path to being a teacher. We want to make it wider um, with more, I, the term I have seen is off ramp for people who aren't effective, and I'm still not clear on how we're measuring effectiveness. So I think to, to kind of ask us to determine what skills we need to go from one, one piece to the next, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about the end goal. Where are we going with this? What is, what is that? What do we want the perfect teacher, maybe not perfect, maybe I should say a starter teacher to be able to do? And then what do we want advanced teachers to be able to do? And looking at what are we currently asking them to do? And does that encompass everything we want or we want to see? Um, and, and, you know, there's so many moving pieces. I appreciate the DPI folks for <laughs> the challenging work that you have, but um, those are just a couple of things that, that come out to me. I'm glad to put that link to the current Certificate of Teacher Capacity um, document in the um, chat if people are interested in seeing that, but it does, it does pull from the, from the current rubric and it does give, give us sort of a, a list of, you know, here's what we're currently asking and we might look at that to say, is there something here that's missing? Not necessarily the standards, but more, more the skills. Yes, I'll be glad to. And I definitely gr agree with all of the aforementioned. This is Tabari Wallace. Um, and I, I just posed a question in the chat. Um, if not the principal, then who for qualitative measures in regards to effectiveness, especially in the advanced teacher adult leadership role? Um, the advanced teacher classroom excellence, um, that can be done quantitatively per test results. Um, but in regards to how, who best leads teachers, in that advanced teacher role right now, the principal is the one who provides the buddy teacher and who, and who matches up expertise um, versus mentor versus mentee. Um, some teachers need assistance in classroom management. You want to match your teacher with a great um, veteran teacher that has great classroom management skills. Um, and I can go all the way down the paradigm. So if not the principal, assistant principal, then who? Um, who would do that? How do you do that externally um, within a building? when you're trying to build uh, teachers and, and build leaders' uh, capacity? That's just a question I just wanted to throw out there. Mr. Wallace, uh, this is Keisha. Um, I, I, I completely agree with you. 
you. Um, with that, you, I think you put something in the chat about, you know, making sure that principals are trained to be able to do that because that's where you see some discrepancies as well is that principals are close to start to be able to sit deep, look at orders, be able to identify what's happening, what's not happening. However, um, the capacity of our principals are not the same too and, and whatever we use, um, that needs to be addressed. So I agree with you on both accounts. And to follow up with what Keisha just said, um, then I'll, and I'll, I'll be quiet, I don't talk much about these, but um, there is a safety net within the evaluation system, the teacher evaluation system, and our principal's evaluation system. It is called an artifact. Um, if the teacher disagrees with the rating and thinks they should be farther right on the rating, they have the option to upload an artifact within the system. Once the principal reviews the artifact and then agrees, usually, usually um, they can come to an agreement where that mark should be. If the teacher is still dissatisfied, then they can go further. But there is a safe mechanism within the evaluation instrument for the teacher if they feel that they have been slighted, that they can upload an artifact to prove their proficiency in that particular element. And then uh, a, a further discussion is needed, and then hopefully a compromise is made, and then the teacher is satisfied afterwards. If not, there are further steps to take with that as well. Yeah, this is Robert. I, I appreciate all the things that Tabari is sharing, and I think, um, uh, like Laura mentioned a minute ago, Tom's statement about the inconsistency in what we see from principal evaluations across the state. Every time I hear him say that, I bristle a little, but I know that he's not saying that that instrument is not helpful. What he's saying is currently what we learn from folks from that instrument is inconsistent across the state. It's not particularly dependable. So what that has surfaced in Tabari's comment as well as in the chat is that if, if the teacher evaluation system or process influences this movement through the license process, then we need to be confident that principals across the state are conducting it in a similar manner. So what that's generating is a need for future training. And I think everybody who has spoken up about this agrees that that's important. However, I think in trying to solve it now will slow us down in what we need to accomplish. So as we think about this, I think what's going to happen is we're going to generate ideas that are, when this is in place, we also have to have these kinds of resources or these kinds of trainings. So I think one of the things that Michael and Marie and I are going to need to do is make sure we capture some of those things and hang them over in the closet with the idea that once we're able to successfully establish these um, skills that need to happen and the thresholds of expectation across this diagram that we see on the screen, then when all of this moves forward, then we open that closet and say, okay, now what? What does the landscape of support need to look like? What do principals need to know how to do? And to the degree that we can, when we think about how we help principals right now, tomorrow, next week, understand the evaluation rubric, we can work as DPI staff members to try to improve that consistency as much as we can. Um, I'm excited to hear all these connections. I think this is really powerful, but I also think Greg's, I think it was Greg that put in the chat bar, part of our initial work is to figure out what's in each of the buckets of expectation as you move across the line for each of these. So this is powerful discussion, and given my work at the agency, I really appreciate the connection to the evaluation system. I just want us to make sure it doesn't become something we trip over as we try to move forward. Uh, this is this is Tom discovered. May I make absolutely, Tom? Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so I want to clarify <laughs> my statement. Um, I, I don't think. So let me just articulate a couple of things that are important. Currently, principal evaluation um, has no connection to the licensure process. So you know, using that as a as as a measure. Um, needs some careful consideration. Um, it, I think there's a there's a renewal process aside. There's a, there's a connection with renewal uh, renewing the CPL, but other than that, there's really no connection between the evaluation process and and licensure, and that's by design. Um, okay, that was that was done a couple of years ago to kind of bifurcate these two processes because employment doesn't. Um, the, the employment doesn't uh, affect the license because employment's a local enterprise. Licensing is a statewide endeavor. Um, I don't want us to think that I'm saying that principal observation can't be a part of this. I'm pointing out the um, 
the that it's unreliable uh, and that's because every human possesses bias i mean we cannot eliminate bias from a human being that's that's just impossible but there are ways to counteract that and that is by including multiple when you have a bunch of biased observers you need if you have a bunch of them you can start to uh, strip away that bias and get at the actual undermined thing. So it, I don't want to present it as a we can't use principal observation. We can, but it needs to be bolstered with other um, observations that help us triangulate the, the, the kind of the, the signal from the noise. And that's, that's a very important thing and that's something we can talk about later. Um, but there are great models for this across the country. Like, uh, I think if you look at Maryland, their peer assistance program, how they're using master teachers um, to, to help uh, determine whether those skills and competencies exist with teachers. And then there's folks that have used student surveys to, to get at this. So by, it, I don't want you to think that the principals don't have a place in this. That's not what I'm saying at all. I, I'm saying you need to think about that in terms of a sole measure of this. So um, that's all I wanted to, I, I, I just wanted to make sure I clarify. I didn't want to make it sound like I was principal bashing by any means. Uh, Greg Monroe here. I, one of the things that, the guiding questions that we started out and what has been guiding my uh, thinking with regard to the things that uh, we've been discussing is, you know, and I think we bled over to some of the other community work that we talk about, that the, the buckets, that initial question, what are the skills, that if we can focus on what are the skills, everything else will then watch itself out through um, other conversations uh, so that, you know, to me, I think that would focus on or bring us back to the initial question is what skills does the teacher have to have to move to that next level? So. My thinking, as everyone was talking, is in the, the, the lower level, what skills do I'm looking at for the basic teachers? And I'll just list in those skills in each of those buckets. And then the conversation can then start talking about the measure of those skills. But I think if we really focus on that initial question and, and start filling that each of those buckets with the skills, then we can start to see a clear picture of, of what we would do to measure or evaluate those particular skills. So for me, it would be helpful if somebody would tell us, okay, so where are we starting and moving on that? Because it feels like we're just sort of hanging the questions out there. And if we could, you know, I don't, I don't know where we start, but I mean, I would argue that I think every student needs a completely certified qualified teacher so when we start backing off what what goes in level one and what goes in level two it would be helpful to me for us to you know start with a, a stripping away of okay so what are the bare essentials is that where we're is that where we're starting is sort of with a i, I guess what i'm asking is how we're working are we going to start with okay this is what we want every teacher to be able to do and we're going to work back from that or are we going to start with how are we handling this work? Maybe that's a Maureen, uh, Michael question. So, you know, like when you look at the chart, can you go back to the, um, the picture of all the, the different levels? So when you look, you'll see there's that blue line between level three and level four. And really, I mean, there, there could be teachers that will get to level four and choose to stay at level four. They do not want to move on to be an advanced teacher. They do not want to be part of adult leadership. So. I think that's a great question, like what will we expect a level four expert teacher to be, and then to kind of step back from there. But you'll notice that when you look at like level one or at the learning permit or at level two, you're gonna see that it says paired with an advanced teacher. So you're still gonna have that teacher who is the, the expert teacher, advanced teacher, who's gonna be working with those teachers in level one and level two, helping to guide them and mentor them and giving them support. Um, you know, I, I'm someone who's worked with student teachers frequently throughout my teaching career, and they're with me for those 18 weeks, but then we put them into a classroom by themselves as a first year teacher. They do have a mentor teacher, but that mentor teacher isn't always going to be able to be there to support them because many times that mentor teacher is teaching their own class of 35 kids while that brand new teacher is teaching their own class. And so 
I think this new system is really setting us up so that you have those new teachers will be fully supported by an advanced teacher who is being paired with them and working with them strategically to help them move through these different licensure structures. Um, but that's gonna be the work that we need to figure out. So we are gonna need to figure out, okay, what, what is it that we're looking for as the, the end goal if we have somebody that wants to get to level four and stay at level four? What would you need to do to be moving through each one of those license one, license two, license three, and into license four? And some of that is already there. So if you look, you can see where it says, like you have to, to, to demonstrate content knowledge and pet pedagogy, so, or pedagogy, and then hold just a master, or hold just a bachelor's degree for license one. So some of that work is already there a little bit, but then we need to determine, okay, what would be the skills that you would need to have in order to demonstrate that you have content knowledge? What would be, where do we need to put in that you have classroom management abilities? Um, how will we measure those things? That's kind of what our work will be um, centered around. And so, but I, I do think that your suggestion that we kind of start with the end and then move backward to figure out, well, how do you, how do you get to that next level? Um, I, I do think that that's a great suggestion. Uh, Marty, I have a question, because you just said something that radically alters my understanding of this document. Um, so, if I look at this and I look at, I'm seeing a couple of things and I think maybe, you know, maybe our DCI friends can help me clarify this. So I see license one, teacher in residency. Currently, the residency teachers are, are the teacher of record and they might have a mentor assigned or they might have a, a support or a coach. Um, you know, different folks support different new teachers in different ways, depending on the district. But they are, they are the teacher of record and they are in their classroom not, not, not with a co-teacher or not with, say, the student-teacher cooperating teacher model, but they are the teacher of record. But you just said um, that the notion of paired with an advanced teacher mentor, something about you said made me think that the license one and the license two folks would not be alone as the teacher of record in a classroom, that they would be working with an advanced mentor teacher similar to the student-teacher cooperating teacher relationship. So can I get some clarity on that? Because the skill set would be very different if these folks were alone as the teacher of record versus not, in my opinion. And Dr. Tongler and Dr. Sox, do you want to take that one specifically? Uh, yeah, so this goes to some questions that have come up from the, uh, the prep and entry folks. Um, so there's some question about that. Um, so, we have to recognize that currently um, a license one teacher, what we would consider a residency teacher who has a bachelor's degree and the, has either passed the praxis exam or has 24 credit hours in the, in the licensure area, does qualify to be a teacher of record. So if you're, if, if you're proposing to change that, um, that's an endorsement of something that was raised in uh, prep and entry that we need to we need to take back to them um, because what was suggested there is um, a license one teacher there may be a difference between a license one teacher who has absolutely no preparation or training and a license one teacher who's completed that prep program but has elected not to demonstrate any of the uh, competencies that would move them to a level two or a level three. So in other words, so just to kind of clarify that scenario in, in current terms, I completed my uh, EPP, but I elected not to attempt a licensure exam um, or do a PPA. So according to this model, that person would also come in as a license one. Well, prep and entry are saying, wait a minute, those would be kind of two different uh, uh, teachers uh, one, we would we would really want that person, uh, the, the the former, the what we consider a resident. Uh, we really want that teacher paired with a, an advanced teacher. The other one, we could see less kind of restricted um, environment for them to begin to just because they've had those pre that preparation, um, but they, for whatever reason, they haven't demonstrated the mastery needed to move to the next license level. So that's something that's being contemplated in the other uh, other group, um, and I certainly think that you can think about it that way. Um, 
in, in the in, in the interim. Um, and but that's a decision that would be made by the prep and entry folks. Do we need do we need that we do we need to bifurcate that license one a bit further and, and be a little clearer about what are the expectations? Clearly on the learning permit side, that teacher is not a teacher of record. But then once you enter license one, that is a teacher of record. And is that a teacher of record um, that has to be in a model like we currently see in our advanced teaching roles? Like you've got a, uh, you've got an advanced teacher, a multi-classroom teacher that is working with you every day um, and, and overseeing your work. Um, or is it something a little more formal? Um, I don't know. That's a, it's a great question. Um, I think there's enough push in um, uh, preparation and entry that you could think about it that way um, and think about the skills that you would need to have to be a license, let's say just for the purposes of clarity, a license 1A or a license 1B. Um, what is that? How do what? Are, what are the skills you need to be a license one B as opposed to a license one A? Um, so, so that's super helpful, Tom. Um, and I, I think that answers the question because I just wanted to be clear that whoever's in license one or two would would be considered the teacher of record. That's a different set of skills than if they're placed with somebody who is a true in classroom mentor. And that would be that would be that would be part of my. My question, I, I do want to ask one other question I think would help me understand again the skill set. So is it the, is it, and I'm at, Tom, I know I'm asking an unfair question because this is a, it's all in flux and, and it's, you're trying to juggle all the balls at one time, I understand that. Um, but so in regards to, I, I see some things and I've heard some things around NTPA and practice still being required as a, condition of mastery, I guess, is one way to look at that. Is there any conversation around making those one option as opposed to something that everybody would have to complete? And I guess what I'm thinking about is you just talked about a scenario where somebody who finished an ECP but couldn't pass the test would be placed in license one. That is, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, assuming that these kids quite fast want to teach a preparation program. If they finish that program and can't pass the test, we have people in that boat right now who are being hired out in public schools. And what I hear about from my teacher friends is we want some we, we wish they didn't have those barriers because they're great teachers, but the states require these tests and I realize there's actually legislative mandates. Um, but I guess my, my question is, if, if a candidate graduates from a prepared teacher preparation program, they've gone through a successful teaching experience, a P-12 partner and, and a university person, multiple people, folks have agreed that these people have finished these programs and have been approved by the state. And then something you just said was if they haven't demonstrated the skills that they could push back to a license level one or maybe a, a le level of license one that isn't as, doesn't require as much supervision. To me, that gets back at, well, if we're establishing these skills that we say that they finish the preparation program that gives them the skills, how, how do those things work as well? So again, I'm not trying to derail us, but I do think some understanding of what's on the table with the other other options, you know, is I think even somebody put in our chat around, you know, NCPA and Praxis, are those one path, but are those going to be required for everybody? Because that's part of the problem that we're running into now, as far as, at least my people and friends are chiming on that, but, you know, they tell me all the time, we've got these people from your program, but they just can't pass this Praxis to them, but they're an amazing teacher. And I'm going to have to fire them because they can't pass the test. You know, are we talking about if they develop these skills and they go to the document them in a preparation program, does that work? Or are those other things off the table? That's kind of, kind of what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, that's a great question. And I can tell you what we've, how we've, we've talked about this with the licensure subcommittee who is developing the measures. We have, um, we have articulated the Human Capital Roundtable's uh, vision that um, these licensure exams not go away, but they are one option in a menu of options for teachers to demonstrate 
their effectiveness or their mastery over content and or pedagogy. So you should anticipate a variety of options for those, for those teachers to demonstrate their effectiveness. So it could be that they pass the practice in the ed TPA. It could be that they um, completed a series of micro-credentials um, you know, in an authentic setting that, that demonstrated they can uh, perform these um, actions or skills for the benefit of student learning. Um, those are, yes, so this is, we've got to open up the, the idea of what it means to demonstrate effectiveness to incorporate things beyond a standardized test. Um, nobody at this point is advocating for the test to go away because we have a great number of teachers for whom that is, that is a, the preferable route and we certainly don't want to shut that down on them. Um, but we, we want to find other ways that teachers that are otherwise effective in their classroom can demonstrate that mastery over the content and the pedagogy. So with that in mind, it probably makes sense to go back to some of the other resources that you have shared and talk about the, the skills, right? I mean, if we're talking about lesson planning, classroom management, you know, cultural responsiveness, what, what are the basic minimums that we would expect to have at those those levels, um, but if those are going to be reflected in those assessments, or those are going to be reflected in some of the pieces that are already out there, then it makes sense to me to be aware of, you know, what's required in those assessments. We want those aligned, right? We don't want to require skills that are not being measured in those other pieces. And that's just a thought. Yep, I agree. someone suggests that we um, we have a working document where we could kind of capture all these ideas and I think that that's a great idea that way if people are thinking of things between meetings we could have a shared document where you could throw stuff in almost like a parking lot um, so that you know as, as different ideas and, and concepts are coming up we would have some place to capture all those um, so another idea would be that maybe with part of that Part of that shared document is that we could have like a chart um, or some kind of um, like Google form or something where we could capture some of the different ideas that each of you have for those different skill sets that you would need to move between um, level one to level two, level two to three, and then three to four, um, so that we could get some of those those ideas captured and organized and see where we have commonalities or also maybe that would give some of us some ideas, like maybe you see somebody else mention something and that would give you a, an idea of a way that maybe you could you could add on to that. Um, so I, I do think that that would be very valuable. So I'll we'll work on getting that and then get that sent out to everybody. That way you have that resource so you can start plugging your ideas in there of where you think different skills would fit in for each one of those different licensure levels. Um, we also had Dr. Gregory, or, uh, Dr. Gregory Monroe made a really great point um, that he sees this kind of like the medical professional system and that, that I think would be a really good parallel where you move through those different stages as in through the medical field before you're a fully licensed doctor. Um, and I do think if we kind of think of it from that perspective of moving through a system where you're, you are practicing the skills you need at each one of those levels so that you're able to attain those skills and then move to the next level, um, I think that's a really good way to kind of look at this and evaluate it because I think that kind of gives us a, an idea in an existing system of how we want to move forward to get our teachers to that expert teacher level and then encourage them to move on to the advanced teacher roles. Um, and so I think that's a really good way to look at it. I'm trying to go through the chat here and see other ones that I've missed. Um, I did see a question up at the very beginning. It kind of goes into what we were talking about with the um, Praxis II and the Ed TPA, but just to make sure that question was answered um, sufficiently, it asked, um, let's see. Sorry, there's lots of great comments in the, uh, in the chat here. So and it, every time somebody puts a new one in it, it pops me down to the bottom. Um, so it, did, it was asked, does this also mean that exams such as Praxis II allows for license one and Ed TPA allows for license two? 
So if you look at license one, license one requires you to have a bachelor's degree or an industry certification. Mm -hmm. the, the license two would be where you would need to have a TPA or a praxis um, to show that you are a, that you have that, those competencies. But you'll notice that for license two, it says or, and for license three, it says and. So this is kind of a, a stair step that enables you to kind of gather those skills and to demonstrate those skills as you move through the process. You do not need to have it completely done for license one. You would be able to acquire those skills as you move through the licensure process. And if Dr. Tomberlin, if you wanted to add anything additionally to that. No, I think you got it. Unless there was something you wanted me to add. <laughs> No, no, not at all. I just, I was just making sure I'm, I'm not missing anything. Um, so let's see. Um, also, I really like, I, there's been a lot of discussion in the chat about the artifacts, and I think that's really important. You know, as a teacher, whenever my principal would come in and do an evaluation, I would always upload artifacts from that lesson that was it being evaluated. Um, even if I was getting in the distinguished column, I still always uploaded artifacts along with that evaluation. And I think that that's really important because I think that's a great skill to help our teachers learn when they're are in the beginning years of their career because that enables them to have things that they are able to show and to use as demonstration of their skills as a teacher. Um, it's also one of the things that I always have my student teachers do. I, I help them make their first portfolio of lessons that they have done and then they take that to their interview with them on their first interview and that tends to help them get hired because instead of just talking about the things that they've acquired and the skills that they have, they can actually show that to whoever is interviewing them, and I think that that's really helpful. So I think that, that that is a great thing that we should be encouraging everyone to include, and I think there would be space for, for either our subcommittee or one of the other subcommittees to somehow integrate that into this new licensure process. And not that it would have to be done for every single lesson, but for some of your highlight lessons, I think that that's a really great, um, really great uh, opportunity to help our teachers develop their ability to make those portfolios, but then also to help our young teachers learn how you use those artifacts to reflect on your lessons so that you can improve your teaching practice. Uh, let's see. Um, we also have a comment, and this is maybe something that, that um, some of the EPP partners that are on the call today could add into it. It says, it, is it also possible that EPPs could recommend a candidate for license two or license three? Um, does anyone have any comments on that? Uh, so this is Tom. I would refer you back to um, the your guiding principles. Um, is this an outcome that can be measured in the presence of students? Um, and does it have impact on students? I'm not saying uh, no, but um, unless you build in the um, unless you build in the process by which that EPP would base that recommendation, um, I would say that would be problematic under your guiding principles. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Can I um, add to that? Can I add a, a point to that? Because it appears that some of our candidates are being hired who are not um, being licensed from. So they would just not be licensed from their EPP. They would just, kind of like our lateral entry, be in license two world. They can still be hired, right? They just have to finish those things by year three. Yes, I do think that's correct, but Dr. Tomlin, do you want to verify that? Uh, yes, that is happening, and um, and so um, though I, I don't think it's it's entirely relevant to the question that was raised. So what I interpreted the question to be, to be was, uh, can an EPP recommend someone for a license two or license three? Uh, just saying, we we determined that this person meets those requirements, and I would um, I would. I would question that um, without a clear understanding of 
what the measures are that, that the EPP is basing that determination on. And then if that's the case, then my question would be, why does the EPP need to, rep, uh, to do that if the, if, the, if the candidate has the demonstrated mastery, if that's happened, why does the EPP need to be, be the recommender? Why can't they just submit that in terms of placing them on the licensure scale? So really, I, I really want to think about this. I want to I, I want to kind of pull you back from thinking about this as external entities that are that are giving something to a teacher. Really, what we're talking about is the teacher him or herself has demonstrated this mastery and is empowered to say this is my demonstration of that skill this is my so this is all in the teacher and the external things are how we measure that thing that's happening within the teacher it's not a it's not a i don't know another term to use here in this one it's not an anointing of the teacher by some external entity it's the teacher has demonstrated this and we can all look at that demonstration and say yep that's it uh so that's, that's my hesitance in, in what's being described here, is this really should be about the empowerment of teachers. They, they know and they can do, and they've done it, and we all have to look at that and recognize that as, yes, that person has mastered that content. Yes, that person has mastered the pedagogy. And um, I wanna get away from the idea that somebody else is verifying that on their behalf. And, and I also, thank you, I appreciate that. I, and I also think it may not be, this may not be the place where this discussion even needs to be happening. <laughs> so, thanks, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. There was also a really great point from um, Nikisha in the chat where um, she asked, do we have an agreed upon understanding or definition of cultural responsiveness between and among the subgroups? This is important for all the subgroups to engage in this work when thinking about how individuals advance from one stage to the next regarding preparation, evaluation, and retention. And I think that's really important. So um, you know, it is extremely important that we are embedding those cultural responsive teaching practices at each level to ensure our teachers have those skills but it is gonna be critically important that we are including all subgroups so that we have a really good holistic understanding of what we mean by cultural responsive teaching practices and how those would be ev evaluated um, and how we would, and what that means to each one of those distinct subgroups. So um, I do definitely agree that that's something we need to include, but that it's something that we need to be very intentional in how we're doing it because we do not want to take away from the importance of the culture responsive teaching practices because we don't fully articulate what those are and how those need to be embedded into our, um, into our teacher skill sets. Um, did anybody have any additional comments on that before I move on to another question? Okay. Um, another one that I saw was asking, could master degrees or national board, cert national board certified teachers be included as in some of the credentials? Um, and I, I'll answer this one for, with my teacher hat on and then I'll, I'll pass it on to the DPI folks. And I'm gonna answer this question as someone who has two master's degrees in education and is planning to start my PhD in education in the next year. Um, in my opinion, the fact that I have master's degrees do not make me a better teacher and I did not have to really demonstrate anything in my classroom in order to earn those master's degrees. National board certification though, and I am not national board certified yet, um, National board certification, though, I really like because you do have to be able to demonstrate the skills of being an effective teacher. So you have to write the portfolio questions, you need to have the videos. Um, there's a lot embedded in that where you are actually demonstrating your expertise in teaching. So I think for what we're looking at here and our ability to really demonstrate expert teaching and to show that we're moving from one level to the next and improving in our teaching practice as we're moving through each one of these levels. I think using things that are similar to national board certified teaching practices, or if we give teachers credit for being nationally board certified, I do think that that, that would be um, something that, that would help us build this out to be a more robust um, certification program. Um, but with the master's degree, I think that we would need to have some very intentional, like, I just, 
And I, 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 I almost, I, I cringe when I say it because I know a lot of people do not like that perspective, that the master's degree did not make me a better teacher. Um, I think it, it did help me in my ability to be a teacher, and I think it's important that we continue education with our teachers and that we're supporting continuing education, but I don't know if it's something that we want to embed into our um, embed into our, our way that we're moving through the, uh, the different levels of being a teacher. And, I, and again, I, I want to preface that with, I am not trying to say that I do not think education for teachers is important. As I said, I do have master's degrees and I'm gonna start my PhD. So I do see the education as important, but I, that, that education it, I don't, does not make me a teacher that should be bumped into the advanced teacher role simply because I have those master's degrees. And this is Robert. This is Robert. I, you know, it's probably most everybody on this call has a master's degree, and I think everybody would would uh, would state that we believe we're better at things because of those master's degrees. But if we think about what Tom said, which is the guiding principle of this work, is what are the things the teacher is doing and the outcomes that emerge that are proof that those skills and behaviors and abilities are in place. If master's degrees intersect with this work at any level, this committee needs to go to the next step and talk more about those skills and how those skills are demonstrated beyond the actual degree itself. I think we just have to remember the guiding principle that we are driven by what the teacher is doing, changing, altering, and producing within the context of their work in teaching. Okay, and I have to chime in here. Okay, I just want to add this, and I, I and I appreciate the the moment. Um, so first, I'm going to say I hate that Maureen didn't get more of her master's degree programs. That is um, that bothers me as somebody who works in higher ed. Like I never want anybody to say that. I always want folks to feel like you know that they got something that helped them become more um, a more effective practitioner. Um, and I know that a lot of our programs try to to go that route. I, I will say this. So I think that we, again, so, and I put this in the chat, I, it would be super helpful if we had a common Google Doc or something online, because I don't think that we all want to take turns reiterating the same things about what make good teachers. It would be great, maybe we could do some online work around that. But I do think that there is a different um, argument or discussion around what is the point of, uh, in the focus of a master's degree program, and what is the focus for and, uh, initial licensure, if you're saying you are a master's degree, and I'm just, I know you and Fisher Arts degree, are, are they going to help somebody move a teacher, you know, their effectiveness data for their P12 students is gonna go up automatically because of a master's degree. I don't know that we can say that because there's a lot of other factors that go in there, and Tom has a lot of data to show how teachers plateau after year seven already uh, that he has shared in other venues. I think when we look at the advanced leadership pieces, there is some space for master's degree programs and maybe those can be articulated more exp explicitly when we talk about those skill sets. Again, I'm still, I know we sort of had this broad conversation and maybe we needed to have that before we dig into the work, but I think, um, you know, our master's programs are really focused on teacher leadership and reflective practice and using research it, in your classrooms and things like that, it's not necessarily on, okay, let's take your data and how can we move your kids to the next level because that's not the focus of those advanced practitioner programs. When I see pieces here about competency in adult leadership via micro-credentials under that adult leadership, I would, I would stack up the work that happens in our master's programs any day when we are talking about developing teacher leadership and I don't know that there is a I don't know how that connection happens any other way right now, except by the principal evaluation. And I don't know that that work and that analysis has really happened. So I think they're, you know, again, and I, I know you're not, that's not what you're saying, Maureen, that um, all master's degrees are bad. And, and as to Robert's point, I would assume probably everybody on this call has probably got one or, or higher. But I do think that it needs to be clear that most of our master's degrees are focused on the skills that I think are probably falling into the advanced leadership column and what do those look like. I do not think it's fair, or, nor do we need to uh, just dismiss master's degrees as being ineffective and so therefore they can't appear on this continuum. That's, that's, that's very dismissive of EPPs 
And it's also something to work at, to, to look at related to, you know, if you want to know more about what happens in our program and what those skills are, let's articulate those and then let us map it back to our programs and talk about that. I find it hard to believe, especially based on the micro-credential report that came out in the last couple of state board and PEPSIC sessions, um, that our master's degrees are less effective than some of these micro-credentialing programs that are currently in place. So I, I, I definitely want to advocate for uh, looking at master's programs, but I don't know that necessarily the skills in a master's program are going to be the same ones that we look at for licensed teacher one in residency. They're not, that's not how most of them are designed. So I'll just throw that out there. So this is Tom. Maybe I can help a little on this issue. Um, the, the, what constitutes a measure is not under the purview of this group. Um, if this group would like to um, make an official uh, recommendation to licensure that master's degrees be considered as a, as a demonstration of mastery of whatever we're talking about here, um, I, I, I'm not clear whether it's a demonstration of content pedagogy or evidence of effectiveness. Um, it could be all three. Um, but if you want to make that recommendation to the licensure uh, group, uh, that is certainly within your um, purview. But the, the actual measures that will constitute this will be developed by licensure. You need, you need to, you have to identify the, the, the configuration of skills that lead you to the next level. Um, you, you, I, I don't want it to sound like the way I'm getting ready to say it. Uh, your, your charge is not to identify what those measures, what, how you measure those things. It's the skills you're identifying. The licensure group will identify the measures that, that allow you to, um, to demonstrate your mastery of those skills. I, I hear you, Tom. I appreciate that. I, I'm not trying to derail us, but I also, I think that there's not a, there's probably some discussion around what those skills are, and then if it falls on an EPP or a micro-credential group or whatever, to map back to those and, and, and put those forward. But, you know, I'm happy to jump in on the skills. How can we do that? What's the best way to do that? So Dr. Hart, thanks so much for bringing up all those points. And, and I agree, as Dr. Tondalin started speaking, that was kind of what I was gonna add in as well, is that, um, you know, like there may be some of those skills that we identify, you, we would be able to, someone would be able to acquire those skills through a master's degree program, but we wouldn't be saying, you know, like you have to have a master's degree in order to move forward. That would, that would be a, another group that'd be working on that. Um, you know, um, we've, we're gonna start a group document or spreadsheet kind of thing so that we're able to put in some of our different ideas and begin working on those skills. And we'll be working over the next several months, we'll be continuing to have meetings where we'll be able to kind of really um, narrow down and really hone in on where each one of those skills that we have identified that are important for different levels of teachers, where each one of those skills will fit in. Um, and so that's something that, that this meeting was kind of our first, let's get some discussion going, let's get some brainstorming going, let's get some thought going so that we're able to kind of get everyone's creative juices flowing on what do, what do I think, based on the description of a level one teacher, what do I think a level one teacher, what are the skills that they would need to have, and then what skills would they need to acquire to then move to level two? Um, and so we will be getting a, a shared document out to everyone so that we're able to start kind of organizing some of those ideas, and then that way everyone will be able to see those ideas between meetings, and then when we come back for our next meeting, we'll be able to really start delving in on the specific skills that are required at each one of these levels so that we're able to clearly articulate what it means to move from a level one to a level two teacher. And, and again, I didn't want it to come across that I do not think a master's degrees are valuable. I do think they are incredibly valuable. And if I went back to the beginning of my teaching career, I would do those master's degrees again. Um, I, just, I just wanted to um, say that, that what we're looking at here are demonstrated skills. And if there's a way that we can work in coursework that you have done in your master's degree to demonstrate those skills to move to the next level, I do think there's value in that for sure.
Okay, do we have any other comments? See, um, I do see that we have one, uh, one more thought about master's degrees. They have different purposes and outcomes. Okay, did I miss any of the questions in the chat? I think I captured all of them, but if, if I missed anyone's question that you posted, um, if you could just unmute and ask that question. Uh, Marie, this is Tom. Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, addressing something that came up earlier, um, Kim is doing a really uh, incredible job of capturing all the comments and compiling resources for folks. I know Google Docs came up a couple times. Uh, we at DPI can't use Google, uh, Google Docs, so we have to host it through um, SharePoint but you should all have access to it. And would it be helpful for Kim to kind of help everybody understand where all these resources are gonna be housed and, and where um, kind of, you know, a chronicle or the archive of your decisions and your discussions would, would be housed? Yeah, I think that'd be very helpful. Kim, if you could do that, that'd be awesome. Sure, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, to start off, as you know, that there's um, all the materials for each meeting that's housed in SharePoint. And I'm gonna also house um, the notes that I'm taking from the chat because I cut and paste the chat right into notes and it saves right into um, my main drive at work. And then I'll just transfer that file to the SharePoint um, system within that um, meeting folder for whichever meeting it is. So I'll do that each time and I'll probably also send the notes out through email because I know that everyone's busy and everyone needs easy access as well as the minutes from each meeting. As far as um, what platform will be used for group work, um, I'm looking at Whiteboard and that's through Microsoft. Um, that's what we're allowed to use through the state and that will allow everyone to um, provide sticky notes around what their thoughts are. It's very similar to Jamboard for Google. Um, so they'll be able to uh, focus on which skills um, should be uh, within each license level. And so I'll have a, a whiteboard for each license level um, and then you can use your sticky notes to express what skills you think should be um, within that license level. Um, okay, I, I was just reading your comment, Marnie. Um, and so as, as uh, I see that we need more resources, I'll be looking at more of the applications through Microsoft and be able to utilize those. Um, but right now it's whiteboard and SharePoint. But please reach out to me if you have any confusion around those or if you're not able to access anything. Yeah, and thank you so much for that, Kim. Kim is, is really doing <clears throat> amazing work to keep all of the, everything together and to make everything very organized so it's easy for us to um, do our work and so we greatly appreciate Kim and everything she's doing in the background so thank you so much for all of your hard work to make sure this continues to move forward. Um, did anyone else have any comments that they wanted to make or questions about kind of how our work will proceed and, and where you can find resources? Hi, this is Melissa Tuli with New America. Um, I don't have questions about resources, but I do have questions about process. So um, I think I've just been trying to wrap my head around, so we talked a little bit about NISAs and about um, the North Carolina Professional Teaching Standards. Uh, it seems like those should sort of be a starting point. Like a, I'm just thinking about like having a bunch of different um, whiteboards out there where people are just sort of sprinkling things and wondering whether having sort of a, a shared understanding of kind of where the current standards might align on this continuum would be helpful for folks sort of being able to not 
um, spend as much time kind of trying to, after the fact, put things back together and people have sort of different understandings of where those current standards align. So I was curious whether there was already a sense of, you know, are those current standards at a license three, license four, um, somewhere in the middle, as, as we just sort of try to think about um, mapping those things out. I guess my, it's a little bit hard for me to think about where it should be if we don't know whether, for example, like a license one or two is the teacher of record or not a teacher of record, um, whether they're sort of more like a sort of traditional resident teacher where they're sort of working in concert with another teacher because I think the skills you need are different. So I'm just trying to kind of think through the process for how we make sure we're all in the same, um, have the same expectations for where these different um, skills should end up. Yeah, that's a great point, and, and thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, Dr. Tomblin or Dr. Sox, do either one of you want to take that question? Yeah, this is Robert. So I think that's really important. Um, I also think there are a probably a broad array of things that could help us identify what goes into each of these buckets. If, you, if we think about, in the document that's on the screen, if we think about the little white space that exists between each of these license levels, that is a threshold that one must pass. So part of the job of this, this subcommittee is to identify the particular sets of skills that are the tickets to the bridge that cross that threshold. So several folks in the comments have referred to those as the buckets. Um, the professional teaching standards absolutely, I believe, are associated with this because teachers are evaluated on those. With that in mind, however, the structure of those standards within the rubric has a very specific design. As a teacher moves from the developing, which is about knowledge, to the proficient, which is about action, to the accomplished, which is about interaction or the results that show up, to the distinguished, which is about the extension of their practice or their influence on others. It's not enough to say where do the professional teaching standards fit along this model. The professional teaching standards in terms of leadership, equity, content, instruction, and reflection for each of the standards, they are a large umbrella that straddles across this entire model. However, those expectations that are in the developing column of the knowledge that teachers need to bring to the table and demonstrate, those probably will gather and group on the left side of this document. And as we move to the right, those will gather and group to the right side. So those things that are in the accomplished column of the rubric that really speak to outcomes. If you look deeply at the teacher evaluation rubric, the accomplished column is visible by looking at what is happening with students. So it gets to demonstration of or change of or impact on what's happening in the classroom. So some of those things are gonna to begin to really emerge as we move from the left side to the right side and be very prominent there in the center. When we move to the right-hand column, the distinguished column, that really is about influence of others. So that's getting into how the teacher is influencing the practice of their colleagues. That will begin to inform the things on the right-hand side. However, the teacher rubric has its limits. There is another state board approved rubric called the teacher leadership specialist rubric that is designed for teachers whose primary job is to help other teachers teach better. So I absolutely agree. We need to think about the standards. We need to identify where they fit into this. I actually think that is probably a, uh, a simple coding process where rather than engaging this group in a great deal of time and energy processing and figuring that out, I really think we can use the structure of the rubric to say where objectively those things tend to logically fall. And then this group could respond to that and say, well, this one needs to move to the left or this one needs to move to the right. And I also believe in addition to the professional teaching standards, part of the thing we may need to consider is also the teacher leadership specialist standards because I think they will deeply influence the gray portion of this document on the right hand side. So I think you're absolutely correct with the idea that we need to think about where those standards fit. I also think it's probably incumbent on Maureen and Michael and myself to actually do a little bit of that sorting and organizing first so that this group has something to respond to and adjust 
rather than just stand in a swamp of standards to try to figure that out. Yeah, and thanks so much for that, Dr. Sox. That, that definitely clarified that question, so thank you very much. Were there any other questions or comments? So just to follow up, so um, is the assumption that we should wait to start populating the whiteboard until we have that document as a starting point with the sort of coding of the current different standards? Maureen, can I ask a question that might actually be a proposal? <laughs> yes, please do. So I'm, Maureen, I know that you and Michael and the DPI facilitators, we're scheduled to do a conversation about this meeting and think about our next steps, and that is on Monday. I'm wondering, I, while the whiteboard is an opportunity for people to capture ideas, I don't know right now that we have a great deal of focus as far as what it is we'd like for people to do. I'm wondering if we should think about using our Monday time to identify a task, an assignment, or a, a series of things so that folks come to the whiteboard with a level of intentionality and purpose, um, and do you feel like that can wait that long if we wait until Monday when you and Michael and the rest of the DPI staff talk about what our next steps are? And I realize I'm putting you on the spot by asking this question, so I apologize for that. You're actually not putting me on the spot at all because I already had that written down on my notes of something I wanted to bring up that we could talk about it on Monday. So um, I do think that's a great idea. Um, I do know that that's a, a couple of days from now, but um, but I, I think that since we already have that meeting scheduled on Monday, I think that'd be a good time for us to really articulate kind of the the expectations and the next next steps forward for this subcommittee. Um, and so we, we have a very clearly defined purpose, um, so that way everyone kind of knows where our work is moving. And, um, okay, great, and then I, Kim just said that she's gonna share the whiteboard on Monday, um, and then that way we'll be able to start working on assignments. Um, another thing that Dr. Mahar and I thought would be very helpful is that as we begin moving forward on the work, that we would break into kind of subgroups or breakout groups um, where you would work with a smaller group to on, on specific tasks or specific assignments and then we could bring that information back to the whole group so that we can all kind of discuss it. But I think that will make things a lot more manageable. And so you will see that coming out here um, in the next couple of days to weeks as well as we start figuring out like how we're gonna break everybody up into those subgroups. Um, but I do very much appreciate all of the comments and questions today. I think it really helped bring up some of the, the different concerns and some different ideas and some of the different questions that surround the work that we're gonna be doing. Um, I do realize that, that this is a lot of work and it's, it's um, not clearly defined right now as much as I, I'm sure we would all really like it to be because it's something new and it's something that we're taking on in North Carolina that we haven't seen happen anywhere else. So this would truly redefine the way that, that we are um, helping our teachers continue to improve and move through their teaching practice and by acquiring new skills so they're able to move to different levels of teaching um, and I think that this is something that when, when we have this finished, all of the, the kind of little bits of trying to navigate through it and the challenges we're facing right now will be well worth the end product because I think that these conversations are going to be what gets us to a really great product um, at the end of the process so that we have this really robust way that we're identifying our teachers, what level that they are beginning in and how they can clearly move through each one of those additional levels um, as they continue through their teaching career and profession. And so I, I thank each of you for being here this morning and for sharing all of your thoughts. Um, if there's anything else that someone would like to add, please go ahead and jump on. Um, but I, I really do appreciate everyone being here and for all of the, the hard work that you're putting into this. Um, I know that this is, it takes a lot of time out of everyone's days and it is greatly appreciated that all of you are here and providing the inputs and ideas and you're bringing up your concerns so that we're able to really come to a, a really cohesive, fantastic product when we finish the process. Um, Mrs. Stover, do you want to entertain a motion for adjournment? 
I was going to, I just, I was waiting to see if anybody had anything they wanted to add. So I was, I was trying to give that teacher wait time there for a second. Yeah, you're so much better at a teacher. You're, you're already more effective than I am as a teacher. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know about that, but. Okay, well, since we didn't have anyone else jump on, um, I, can I, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn today's meeting? Gregory Monroe, so move. All right, thank you. And can I get a second, please? To Barry Wallace, second. All right, thank you. And thank you all so much for being here today. Um, oh, I guess we have to vote. Is there any, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, so the motion carries. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we greatly appreciate all of your work around this and we will be in touch soon with the additional resources and SharePoint. We'll also get the whiteboard out to you here in the next couple of days and um, we will begin working on some a some, uh, little bit more clearly defined assignments and tasks that our group can do as we move forward. So thank you all so much for being here today. Thanks everybody.